I hear yeah and Twenty-two, twenty-four, and thirty. All right, let's see. We'll start with twenty-two. Well, twenty-two has a big blue nun by it. I haven't looked at anything else. So three x squared plus three x minus two. What am I doing? Finding string values of the function and where they occur. Okay, so if this is a non-calculator problem, any guesses on how I'm gonna find the zeros? Oh, I haven't done the do Never mind. Jeez Louise, Stacy. I was sitting here going, okay, let's PRZ this bad boy and let's go with it, but we got to do the derivative first. Oh my goodness. 3x squared minus 6x plus 3. I can definitely take a 3 out of these. x squared minus 2x plus 1. What multiplies to 1 but adds? Oh, that one factors. That's nice x minus 1 squared. So it looks like I only have one potential critical point, right? And because this is a polynomial, there's no domain restrictions, so I'm off forever left and forever right. So the only point I'm looking at is 1 for my potential. All right. So I will test. Um, let's try 0. Well, this is always going to be positive, right? Because I'm squaring it times a positive. So no matter what I plug in, I'm always going to get a positive. Agree? Disagree? Because my function is always increasing, which makes sense because this is a cubic, right? And a cubic kind of does this. It's always increasing. There's no max or min here. So no critical points. No extreme points. Does that make sense? Whoever asked that one. And then which one? 24? Yes, I'm a yeah, Are y'all okay? Yeah. Okay. Whatever. X squared minus 1. Um, let's see. I have some undefined points here. I don't. X squared minus 1. I can't have 0 in the bottom. I've got some vertical asymptotes I know on this graph at 1 and negative 1, right? Okay, let's do the derivative. Derivative. I'm going to do power. Negative 1, x squared minus 1 to the negative 2, and then I'm going to chain it. Is that what y'all did? Which is really negative 2x over x squared minus 1 a squared. So I need to look at x equals 0. And I need to look at where the bottom equals 0, so where x squared minus 1 equals 0, so I'm also going to look at that plus minus 1. Negative 1, 0. Let's test them. When I'm less than negative 1, my bottom's always going to be positive, right? Because I'm squaring. So I'm just going to look at the sign of the top. And so the top here would be positive because I'm plugging in a negative. Same thing here. Positive, positive. Here, because I'm plugging in a positive and up top, that would give me a negative, And, of course, still negative. So it looks like I have one extreme, and that is at x equals 0. What is the value there? Well, what's y of 0? Right? So I have a max value of 1 at x equals 0, negative 1. Does that make sense? Why is that there? Because y prime changes from positive to negative at that. 
don't know if this one asks you for all that. Just the extreme values and where they occur, not why. Y'all asked about another one. What was the other one? 30? 26 and 30? 26, um, 1 over, is that a cube root? Cube root of 1 minus x squared. Hmm, 1 minus x squared needs to stay positive. And it's actually going to be just greater than 0, not greater than or equal to 0. Why? It's in the bottom. That's exactly right. I can't have a 0 in the denominator. So it's not greater than or equal to 0. It's just greater than 0. I'm going to subtract 1 and then divide by negative 1. So my sign is going to flip. Right? Right. So x is smaller than 0. So it looks like I do have a restriction. Right. No, I don't have to do all that, y'all. The dir, Stacy. Why don't I have to do that? It's a cube root, not a square root. Only thing I got to worry about is the bottom being zero. So x can't be one. That's the only thing I need to worry about. Do y'all see why? Does that make sense? Everyone's like, yeah, whatever. You already started that. Now I'm confused. Okay, sorry. Let's do derivatives. Negative one third, one minus x squared. What is negative one third minus one? Try it. Derivative. Don't forget your chain. And so the two negatives are going to cancel each other out, and I have two x over three one minus x squared two. Where is it zero? Top to zero, zero. Bottom to zero. That doesn't matter. Where is one minus x squared equal to zero? Where is x squared equal to one? Plus or minus one again. Looks like the same test points. Is that what y'all got? Negative one, zero, one. All right, again, the bottom is going to always stay positive because no matter what else I'm doing, I'm raising to the fourth power, which is going to cause it to go positive, right? So I don't even have to worry about the bottom. I'm just going to look at the sign at the top. Negative. Between zero and negative one is still negative. Positive. Looks like the same thing, but just backwards. So what's y of 0? Go back to that original. If I put 0 in here, I get 1 over 1. This time it's positive 1. So I have a minimum of 1 at x. Make sense? Y'all okay? Ten thirty. Oh, did thirty factors? No. X squared plus two X plus two. Um, it looks like I do have some undivided I've got some vertical asymptotes there. They're gonna impact my but they're going to be nasty. That doesn't factor. But still, I'll pick those up with the derivative. No endpoint domain restriction. So let's go on with the derivative. Ugh. Did y'all do power or quotient? Like, did you make it to the negative one? That's probably what I did. Derivative of the top times the bottom. Oops. 
minus the top times derivative of the bottom. Oh my great squared. I'm gonna leave it like that because I'm I might I might be able to work with that a little better before expanding it. Um let's see, I've got x squared plus two x plus two minus um, 2x squared plus 2x plus 2x, so plus 4x plus 2. That would give me negative x squared <coughs> minus 2x. The 2's cancel. On to the zeros and undefines. If this goes to zero, I need to factor out. I'm going to factor out negative x. Yes, no, maybe so. And then the bottom. If y'all do quadratic formula. Yep. Sorry, because I put out a negative x. Did y'all do quadratic formula on the bottom? You tried. <laughs> so it was a complex, so it's an imaginary. Oh, so we don't have to worry about it then if it's imaginary. So just to show you. I have to b plus minus squared of, let's see, b squared minus 4 times a times c. So because that discriminant is negative here, you're absolutely right. That tells me that it's imaginary solutions, so that I don't have to worry about imaginary solutions. So I'm only looking at 0 and negative 2. Bottom's always going to be positive because it's squared. So again, I'm only looking at the top. Um, if I plug in, let's say negative three, that would be negative nine minus negative six. So I'm still negative. But if I plug in negative one, that would be negative one minus negative two, which would be plus, so it's positive. And then if I plug in positive 1, I should be back to What you mean? You have to test every interval. Every interval this long. So you want, at, you, you, you hope you have very few test points critical points, extreme points. So now I can conclude, well, let's do y of negative 2, which would be, what's my equation, x plus 1, x squared plus 2x plus 2. So negative 1 over 2. And y of 0 one over two. So therefore I have a minimum value. What's my minimum value? Negative one half at negative two. And I have a maximum value of positive one half at What do you think? One of the piecewise ones? Yeah, which one? Let's do 41. Y'all would pick 41. It looks the worst. Okay. These are not my favorite. 
Um, 39 and 41, I think, or 40 and 41. Which ones did you do? I don't remember. 39 and 41. We did 42 together. Plus 4 when x is less than or equal to 1, and then negative x squared plus 6x. Y'all haven't even asked me about your test. No, I didn't grade them yet. <laughs> <laughs> oh, I was I started the key yesterday. I'm so sorry, y'all. Um, we'll definitely be after Leah now. Oh no, I did that wrong. I realized after I left yesterday that I had done that. Y'all won't be here Monday and Tuesday. Holy cow. It's a records day. Mondays are records day. Tuesday's election day. Like a teacher work day. Well, that's what we have to do. It's okay. I might. <laughs> No, I'm just kidding. I wouldn't do that. All right, y'all ready for this one? <laughs> all right i'm definitely going to test one because that's my point of possible discontinuity but it's still the point that some crazy stuff could happen so i'm going to test one um let's do derivative this before i start getting all crazy wanting to find set it equal to zero already um negative 2x minus 2 negative 2x plus 6 this makes a lot easier to solve than what it was to start with um, so I am going to do x equals 1, nope, negative 1, I have 1 divided by negative 2, and x equals 3. So what y'all got? Set them both to 0. This one to 0, this one to 0, and then I'm also going to take this 1 here, and I'm going to test that point as well. So I got negative 1. One, three. Knowing what you know, these are both parabolas, right? So it just depends on if I pick up, both of them are parabolas opening down. So depending on where they connect and what happens, I could have two possible extreme points, but I don't know. I'll test them and see. Because they want to use calculus, not algebra to do this. Okay, so derivative function. What thing? The sign analysis? No, but how else are you doing it? You don't, so the sign analysis is not mandatory or anything like that. Um, it just helps you keep everything together. But if you just, I mean, if you came over and said when x is less than negative 1, it's positive or whatever. When x is between 1 and 3, when x is great. If you want to do it like that, that's fine too. Um, okay, so less than negative 1. That means I am this equation. So I would be po positive. Negative 2 would be positive 4, yeah. How about between negative 1 and 1? Negative. Plug in a 0 there. How about between 1 and 3? So I've jumped down to the next equation, right? So if I plug in a 2, negative 2 times 2 is negative 4 is still positive. That's right. And then bigger than 3, negative. Oh, look at there. Looks like I've got 1, 2, 3 critical points. Very extreme points. Um, so I would need to find y of negative 1. I need to find y of 1 and y of 3. I'm not going to have any extra, any absolutes here, right? Because 
one, I don't have endpoints. That's that extreme value theorem. If I had endpoints, I'd have to have absolutes. But because my ends are going in opposite directions, the right end is going down, right down. Oh, I would. I would. Never mind, I lied. Did they ask you to find that? If they were absolute or not. No, it just said local extreme. Okay. Sorry. Talking to myself. All right, what's y of negative 1? Go back to your original equations. I am using the first one. Negative 1 plus 2 plus 4, 5. Hubert says. What about y of 1? One. How about Y of three? Thank you. Maximum value of five at negative one, minimum value of one at X equals one, and maximum value of five at three. If it asks you, you're um, oh, they're the same. They're the same. I would say that that the function has an absolute max of five occurring at both negative one and three, because you're when you start talking about an absolute value, when we get to this point, you're talking or an absolute max or min, you're talking about the highest value that the function takes on. So it does, that is the highest it takes on, and it's just one y value, but it occurs twice. So yeah, it's just one absolute, but at two points, if that makes sense. Or MVT, that we'll call it. Definitely tested. It'll be, more than likely, you'll see it as a part on an FRQ, as well as probably one or two um, multiple choice questions. Multiple choice will probably be more like checking continuity kind of thing and differentiability. The um, FRQ will probably be something like justi justifying why you can have a value of something. But anyway, just so you know that this is very important is why I say all that, that it, it's definitely tested. But it's not a hard concept, so if you learn it and understand it, it's an easy way to gain points by saying, oh, this is true by the MVT because it works all the time. All right, so here's what has to happen. Um, your function must be continuous on a closed interval. It doesn't mean that you, your function has to be restricted. It just means within a certain area, uh, within a certain interval, the function is continuous. So we'll say the function is continuous on a closed interval a, b. Okay, and don't let the variable scare you or anything like that. It's just saying that within a certain range of numbers, the function is continuous and differentiable on remember we don't include endpoints on differentiability then if that's true okay so my a b is my interval that's what i'm looking in between and i'll draw you a picture in just a second and show you so i can draw your picture now um, this will be A, this will be B. Whatever this function does, and I mean, I could keep going on forever or whatever, but my function in between these two values is both differentiable and continuous. Would you agree with that on this particular function? Just say yes. Okay, thank you. All right, so if that's true, what, what the mean value theorem says is that the average rate of change between the endpoints, so And I'm just going to plug in this way because it'll. I feel like it makes a little more sense. That's a rock, right? That's how we find average rate of change or slope. The slope between these two points. There is a point somewhere in between there where I rock has the same value. There exists 
a C there exists a C on a B. So in other words, there's some value in between here. In a nutshell, this says A rock will equal A rock. At least one time. Okay. The slope of this line that connects those two will be the same as the slope of at least one tan line somewhere in between those two points. I don't know where it, it's not here. It's not right. So maybe well maybe it is closer to like right here. But somewhere in between these two points, at least one time, the tan line will take on the same slope. Does that make sense? Are y'all sure? Somewhere in the interval, A rock will equal I rock. That's all it's saying. But your key here is continuous indifferentiability. Continuity indifferentiability. If it's not continuous, that doesn't hold true. If there's a hole, you can't use MVT. And they'll do that to you. They'll throw one in there that's not continuous or not differentiable at a point. Or maybe it's, you see what I'm saying? So it's got to be differentiable and continuous on the whole thing. But if that's true, then A rock will equal I rock. Okay. And there's a couple corollaries that go with it. Y'all know what corollaries mean? Not like the veins. Isn't that a vein too? No. Capillary. Look at me. I don't know anything about all that. Okay. And what those say is that. I think this is one R. No, that should look better. I don't know. Corollary, one of the corollaries to the mean value theorem is that if the derivative, and you guys already know this, if the derivative is positive on AB, what's the function doing? We've done this in our sign analysis since the beginning. It's increasing. And the same holds true if the derivative is negative. Again, I told you, you already knew all this. We're just kind of putting it all together. But that's why it works is the mean value theorem. So let's do some examples. That's the whole mean value theorem. It's literally this whole lesson. Um, you may see words like rising for increasing, falling for decreasing. Uh, we'll also talk about and cover as well. We'll hold that till next week. All right, let's do an example. Yep. Changing around the numbers, but I originally wanted to do it. The question for this says Part A. State whether or not the function satisfies the mean value theorem on the given interval. If it does, find each value of C that satisfies the equation. And the equation is F prime of C equals F of B minus F of A over B minus A. So in other words, where does I rock equal A rock is what it's saying on this interval. So I have to check first continuity and differentiability on this interval, right? Because those are the two keys that allow me to do this. So, is this function continuous on the interval 0, 1? And how do you know? Yes, it is. 
right? Is everybody okay there? Where would this function not be continuous or not be differentiable? Or would it always be differentiable and continuous? Graph it and look at it. This one have a vertical tangent. So it is so it's continuous on the closed interval and because differentiability doesn't include that endpoint I can say yes it's differentiable and continuous on that even though there is a cusp there this is the one that looks like this Okay so continuity 0 to 1 even though this is at zero here, okay, even though it's not differentiable, it, it is continuous. This function is continuous here, right? It's not differentiable there. That's the only thing about this function is it's not differentiable. Would you agree? So it just has to be differentiable on zero, one, not including zero. So since I don't include zero, I am differentiable on my whole interval. Differentiability doesn't include endpoints. Because look back at your definition of mean value theorem back here. It's got to be continuous on AB and differentiable on AB exclusive. So don't include the endpoints on differentiability. Continuity, I do. Okay. Y'all okay? So, since that's true, then it says, so A is yes, the function does meet the hypothesis of the mean value theorem. So, since it does, I need to find each value of C in the interval AB that satisfies the equation. Well, where does A rock equal I rock? So, how am I going to show that? Well, the first thing I'm going to do is I'm going to find a rock on the interval. That's easy enough, right? 0 to 1. So I'm going to do f of 1 minus f of 0 over 1 minus 0. I'm rising to the 2 thirds, so it's 1 minus 0 over 1, which is 1. Does that make sense? Where does that equal I rock? Well, I rock is, right? But I don't know what C is. C is what I'm looking for. So let's find the derivative, right? Because that's I rock. I rock is the derivative. What is the derivative of X? I mean, the derivative of F with respect to X. Two thirds X to the negative one third. That's my I rock. Now solve it. How do you get rid of that negative one third? Close. Right? Because I need it to go away completely. So what do I multiply it by to get it to go away completely? So I'm going to get 2 cubed over 3 cubed. That's the point where it satisfies the mean value theorem. All right, so steps. This one I, I probably can do steps for. I hope. Um, so what did I do? The first thing I did was check for continuity 
and differentiability. If either of those fail, stop. Okay. But if it passes, find a rock on your interval. Set it equal to the derivative and solve. Because it said find the value of C in the interval that satisfies the mean value theorem. That won't help us sketch the graph. But what will help us sketch the graph are the intervals that are increasing and decreasing. But yeah, that won't help us sketch that well. Yeah. How about this one? This is a quick one, and then I'll show you the increasing, decreasing, and I'll stop. Does it satisfy the mean value theorem on that interval? What's a cube root graph look like? has a vertical tangent at zero. So I don't have to go any further on this one. This one is not differentiable at zero, and zero is smack in the middle of my interval here. So no, this does not satisfy the mean value theorem because it's not differentiable at zero. Does that make sense? You said no. Okay. So remember differentiability I'm looking for Discontinuities, I'm looking for vertical tangents, cusp, oscillations, all those things would cause me not to have, not to be differentiable at that point. So because this one has a vertical tangent here, it's not differentiable at zero. And so if it's not continuous and differentiable on the interval, then it doesn't satisfy me value theorem. I can't do it. You can take the derivative. The derivative from the left is equal to the derivative from the right. And remember, derivative is just slope of the tan line. So the slope of the tan lines as you come in are the same. And for this one, the slope of the tan line would be undefined because it's a vertical line, which is why it's that vertical line. And a little bit different. It's number 22. Find the local extrema and indicate the intervals on which the function is increasing and decreasing. So hopefully this doesn't look much different than what you've already been doing. And by the way, the one we just did, this one was number three. Well, it's not it's not differentiable, so that's all we had put. It's got a vertical tangent on the interval, so it's not differentiable. So you stop. This was a little bit harder. 
increasing decreasing intervals and extrema this these are more writing than work when we get to these What do you do first? Derivative. It's always a derivative. <laughs> How do you even remember what you did on the past? Yeah. I bet you didn't. I I did. Kenzie sat up in the middle of the night last night. I see the lights come on, and I was like, what are you doing? I just realized how I should word my conclusion in my paper that's due tomorrow, so I'm going to rewrite it. And I'm like, are you kidding me? Like, you you laid in bed, went to sleep, and then went, oh, I think. Well, I didn't really go to sleep. I just thought about it. It's two major grades, so I need to go fix it. And I was like, y'all do that too? Yeah. Like with my, oh my like, god! Like, I was almost with like ideas, and like as I was going to sleep, so I just could have been like, "Yeah, that's what it is." Yeah, I'm like, I What I change? Yeah. I was like, what? I'm just going to leave it like that because actually, this is a non calculator problem. I'm going to leave it with the root in there because who cares? Who cares? <laughs> Square root of five is actually better than rounding off to a decimal, so leave it. It comes back to, it's exactly what we just did. You talking about last night? Yes. It's exactly what we just did, but now the difference is um, I'm naming the increasing, decreasing intervals. And that's the part that comes from the mean value theorem, is that it increases when it's positive and decreases. So we already knew that. We just... The justification is going to be the hard part here because that's what they look for. You you have to give the justification. Remember, your sign chart's not enough justification. It used to be, which was nice. You could just say it has a minimum, it has a maximum. Now you have to say why it has a minimum, and maximum. All right. So let's plug in. Let's see. Remember, we're looking at the derivative to tell what the function is doing. Always into the derivative equation. So this, when I write y prime down here and I do the plus or minuses. That's whenever I plug into the derivative, what's the sign of the derivative, and it tells me what the function is doing. So I write do the arrows up or down here. So what I'm, I'm always plugging into the derivative because the derivative tells me what the function is doing. So here, you can plug it into this one, this one, or this one because they're all the same. Whichever one's easiest for you to plug into to look. Normally, once it's factored down, and this one where it's cleaned up when I'm solving is a little easier to plug into, because you can say, oh, i got a positive times a negative, or a negative times or whatever it is. But if you understand it better here, it's whatever your mental math is better to help you do, because you won't have a calculator for one like this. So whichever one's easiest for you to look at and kind of analyze. I think this one's a little easier because I can look. I got two things multiplied together, so I can do the sign of each one. So if I plug in, let's say, I don't know, that's five, so it's smaller than eight, so negative three maybe. If I plug in negative three here, you see what I'm saying? Then I'd get a negative times a positive. 
So this would be negative, which means my function is decreasing. Maybe negative 1 would give me a negative times a negative, which is a positive. Positive 1 would be a positive times a positive, right? Nope, positive times a negative, I'm just kidding. Which is a negative. Then super big, right, would be a positive times a positive, which is a positive, so I'm increasing. So here's the, okay, I don't hate them. Here we go. Part A says, Name the local extrema. That's what we've been doing, right? So part A. We have a, oh, I need to plug it in. Actually, does it say the value or does it say, this is the local extrema. Okay. Well, then we'll just say, I have a minimum. at x equals negative square root of 5 and square root of 5 because y prime changes from negative to positive. I have a maximum at x equals 0 because the derivative changes from positive to negative. MVT. Mm -hmm. That's fine. MVT, EVT. The the big ones, they're okay to do that. Yes. I will double check and make sure, but we've always been able to. All right. The others don't take quite as much writing. Where am I increasing? Y is increasing on what? Negative square root 5 to 0. My increasing and decreasing are inclusive. Is that it? And from square root of 5 to infinity, but I need to say why, because the derivative is positive. But I need to rewrite my interval, because remember, derivatives don't include endpoints. So, because the derivative is positive, or you can say y prime, Negative square root of 5 to 0, square root of 5. Are you starting to see the repetitiveness of calculus? Like how you learn something and then you just keep doing it? That's one good thing about it. So what seems hard now, don't worry, because we'll just keep running it in the ground until we... And then y is decreasing on, or am I decreasing? Negative infinity to negative root 5, and then 0 to 5. Because the derivative is less than 0. I know this seems silly.
but you lose your answer points if you don't do your best quotations.